the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Rejoice with Jerusalem, and be glad for her, all you who love her. And they may be I was glad when they said to me, Let us go up to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing in the gates of all Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure and loving. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, Peace be within you. Lord, Lord and be to the Father, and to the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning. As now, as will be Amen. Amen. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her, all you who love her. That you may be satisfied her consoled rest. Lord Jesus Christ, Susan, your beloved child, was reborn in baptismal regeneration by water and the Spirit. Grant that we all be reminded of your victory over death and be renewed in trust and love towards you. Grant us faith to follow where you lead, even to where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Your mercy is anew every morning. And though we sinners deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. We give you thanks for your loving kindness shown to Sue and to all your servants who, having finished their course in faith, now rest from their labors. Grant that we may also be faithful unto death, acknowledging your merciful goodness and giving thanks for all your benefits. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading comes from Exodus, the 16th chapter. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to him, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out of for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness. And behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine, flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as you can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of the persons that, you, that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered, some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever had gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of it over till the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Our second reading comes from Acts, the second chapter. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. 
and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, o Lord. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But well, what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. We confess the faith into which Susan was baptized. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on the cross of fire, was crucified and died in the air. He descended to God. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and stood at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Lord. 
Everything about the story of the Exodus and the wandering in the wilderness points us by example to what it is to be Christian, to be in the church in this world, and what expectation we have for the second coming of Christ. The people of Israel were held in slavery to idolaters in Egypt. God breaks the chains of their bondage. He baptizes them in the Red Sea. And though they are stuck wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, the name of which is conveniently called the wilderness of sin, God sustains them. He gives them miraculous bread from heaven, water from the rock. He gives them the light of a fire to guide them at night and the shelter of a cloud to protect them from the heat at day. He has baptized them in the sea. He provides them with the symbols of his Eucharist beyond that baptism and the symbols of law and gospel, of confession and absolution by protecting them from the elements of night and day. But because of their sin, there is this curse. Because of the worship of the golden calf and other acts of rebellion along the way, God makes this promise, none of them will enter his promised land until they have died. So that finally at the end, the last living of the generation which sinned in the wilderness, when Moses is left deceased on the mountain, being allowed to see the Holy Land from afar, only after that do they enter at the head, with Joshua at the head into the Promised Land and begin the epic battles against Philistine pagan armies that symbolizes the second coming of Christ, the Archangel Michael leading the armies and the battle of Armageddon. Everything in microcosm, in miniature, everything about their life points to our life. And where are we now? We're in the wilderness of sin. We're wandering our 40 years and we cannot see the promised land until we cross over. And even though God has given them all of this protection, this guidance, this strength, this water from the rock, this manna from heaven, the fire and the cloud, they're not happy. The people grumble and complain, and they despise their salvation. Having been delivered from bondage and baptized in the sea, they say to one another, if only we could go back to Egypt. We were better off in Egypt. We were better fed in Egypt. We were better cared for in our slavery. And that too is exactly the same for us. We look backwards to our sin fondly, almost as soon as we've confessed it. Lord, I come before you to confess I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, but you know, some of it, were, some of it was fun. We are completely torn, half-hearted, pathetic, weak, and fragmented beings, just like our forefathers in the wilderness. We can confess our sins and get well beyond it, look back on it fondly, want to go back to it, and sometimes, as Peter says, like a pig to its slop and a dog to its vomit, we keep going back. It's easy to look at the texts where they whine and complain and miss their bondage and say, these people are crazy. But they too in turn would look at us, our half-heartedness, our weakness and meekness in the world in which we are covered with the blessings of Christ, with this manna, with this water, with this blood, where we are covered by these things like confession and absolution and they would look at us and say, what fickle and half-hearted creatures they are to keep going back to their sin. We live in a world that, filled with all of the blessings of God's creation, the beauty, the poetry, the magnificence of love, of family, of nature, of the flowers, the sunsets, the, the infinite beauties of creation that nevertheless are polluted because of the fall into sin at the beginning. No wonder we are half-hearted creatures. We live in a universe that is a mixture of the most beautiful things created by our almighty God and the sin that we brought into the universe that causes all of it to be decrepit and decaying. Because of our sin, there's war and rebellion and pestilence and disease and famine. There's cruelty and perversion there's a world filled with the wretchedness of all the things we use our God-given, God-like intellect to imagine, but can also imagine them for evil and more often than not. 
We, like our ancestors, are stuck wandering in this wilderness of sin until the Armageddon, until the Judgment Day. It's easy for us to get confused about this because we live in a world that overwhelmingly rejects the Word of God and therefore rejects a godly look at the universe. It believes that all the deviancy, the weirdness, the decrepitness, the disease, that all these things are somehow natural, but they're not. We also live in a world that when we lose a loved one with the best of intentions, people will tell us the dumbest stuff. Like, God decided to kill them at this moment. They say God needed another angel in heaven. As if God chooses to kill or he were the author of sin. People will say things that are otherwise silly, like death is a natural part of life and everything is a cycle. The Word of God tells us the opposite. The universe was created perfect, it was created eternal, and there is meant only to be life and love and more life and more love and life and love abundantly, infinitely, beyond any comprehension we have even now of the vastness of the cosmos created by God. It was rebellion and sin that brought death into the world, and so there is absolutely nothing natural about it. And we get glorious, rejoy joyful, times to rejoice, times to praise the Lord, times to cry, all at the same time, like today. It is Laetare, and the day of the church here is named for rejoicing, because that's the psalm that we get to read for today. Rejoice in the Lord. Even in the middle of Lent, the season of penitence, of sacrifice, of fasting, of remembering our sins and being repentant, we get this little window of joy. But then today we remember Susan. We remember Susan with great joy. There is nothing more unnatural in all of the universe than death. Sin brought death into its inexistence, unfeignedness. Death is not even a thing, it is an absence of a thing. It's an absence that God never intended in his creation of the universe. God didn't make it a cycle, it isn't natural, it isn't normal, and there is absolutely nothing in all of the cosmos that could ever make it right. It is not right that someone we loved was here in a moment and gone in the next. It should feel wrong, it should feel unnatural, it should feel positively diabolical because it is. It is the work of sin in us, in the cosmos, sin, death, the devil, and darkness that makes this so, because it should not be. This is the day for rejoicing. Because even in the midst of Lent, in our fasting, in our penitence, in our waiting for the great celebration of Easter, we can still have this miniature Easter of the Word of God that says rejoice. We can look on this fondly and say not only do we have all of the love, the humor, the fun, all of the incredible good times of having Susan with us and among us, but she's also not dead, not the way the world renders death. But there is no oblivion in God's creation, and nothing that is his escapes his hand. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, we look forward to commemorating again as part of the formal church here, has already occurred. He is not in a tomb, he is risen and he is alive, and he says the same thing to us when we approach him in prayer for our lost loved ones that those who have died in the faith, he sends the army of angels to say to us, why do you seek the living among the dead? They are not here, they are risen, they are glorified. And in every measurable, conceivable, and inconceivable sense, Susan and all of the choir in heaven that we see in Revelation are right now more alive than we are. This is the work and will of God Almighty, that despite our sin and rebellion, Despite our bondage to idolatry and the people of Egypt, God has baptized us in the sea, set us a course in the wilderness where he feeds and waters us. He does this now, post his resurrection, for his church. 
from his ascended place in heaven, pouring down these infinite blessings on us to sustain us until the day of his coming. But none, none who perish in the wilderness are lost. Like Moses allowed to see it from the mountaintop, the great prophet and saint Moses, who then goes straightway to heaven, being forgiven of sin, being washed in the blood of a lamb he did not know but look forward to coming. That God has come into human flesh, lived a perfect life in our stead, and died for our sins and the sins of the whole cosmos. That he makes everything right. And even now, the power at work in the cosmos against sin, death, the darkness, and the devil, our disease, our decrepitness, and our war, the power of the Holy Ghost, that fire of the Spirit from Pentecost, transforming and transfiguring and resurrecting this cosmos until the coming in glory of the Lord, when all the dead rise, when all are judged and all are made perfect. Nothing in this makes it easy for us to know that we can't call our loved one right now on the phone. She's not waiting at our door and she won't be there for us to see on any Sunday until the resurrection. Nothing will make that okay and it's all right that we mourn because this tragedy that has entered the world because of our sin has happened. But it is smoke and mirrors. It is shadows and illusion. The reality of the Church of Jesus Christ pouring out from his altar where time touches eternity and eternity spills into it, where it is being drawn perpetually into him. The reality is, as it was meant to be, only life and more life and love and more life infinitely beyond any cosmos as we can even fathom it, where Christ is risen, is risen indeed, his Lord and Master and all the faithful departed are with him rejoicing. And we need only turn to that book, to that part of Revelation, and see the choir rejoicing and be able to say to us where our loved ones are in the crowd, because they are, they are alive, they are alive forever in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
thanksgiving and praise. Holy and magnificent are you. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. You created us in your own image and redeemed us by your precious blood. By your spirit you sanctified us and called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Grant to loved ones comfort in their grief and assure confidence in your loving care that casting all their sorrow on you, they may know the consolation of your love. Help us in the midst of things we cannot fully understand to believe and find comfort in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Receive our thanks for Sue and for all the blessings you bestowed on us through her in this earthly life. Grant that we may with thankful hearts receive your great mercies and express our gratitude not only with our lips but also in our lives as we are given to your service and walk before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Deliver us from sin and error, from the frailties of the flesh, the allurements of this present age, and the temptations of the devil. Grant us faith that works in love, hope that never disappoints, kindness that never fails, confidence in you that never wavers, patience that does not grow weary, and courage always ready to confess you, that we may live in your mercy and die in your peace, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Ghost, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
we are called to pray. Amen. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. He is the Be with you all. Amen. 